hundred or so people got out of their cars and gathered on the west steps of the Capitol. And I want to make a couple comments about this. Um, I uh, I love our country and its Bill of Rights. I have the greatest regard and respect for people's right to petition their government and to protest when they disagree with anything that the government does. I had that corner officer, one of the corner officers in the Capitol for many years in which I listened to and participated in many protests outside the Capitol. And so people who believe that the stay at home orders are misguided, you have the right to hear your voice heard. Make sure your voice is heard. On the other hand, you do not have the right to get out of your cars and gather in mass at any public place because your right to free speech is not absolute. For when you gather it together uh, without the appropriate physical distancing, you jeopardize the health and safety, not only of the people who have gathered, but of course the virus can carry and does carry and you're jeopardizing the health and safety of anybody else you may come into contact with. And so there must be a balance here. Uh, petition your government, do so in, in every safe way imaginable. That is respected and it is honored, but it is still vital that people do not break the stay at home orders. The first amendment does not outweigh the obligation we all have to keep ourselves and each other safe and healthy. I want to talk about the message for a moment because we understand it. I understand the frustration. We are all feeling it. I've expressed many times on this broadcast that I'm feeling it. People want to get back to their normal lives. They miss work, of course. They miss the ability to get together with friends. They miss the uh, opportunity to just engage in whatever their hobby or their passion is. We are all feeling that. But here is the fact that if we were to go back to work and to a normal life today, whatever was gained economically or socially would be short lived because the science tells us that without more testing and without the ability to actually uh, aggregate people in categories, test positive, uh, have had the illness and therefore have the antibodies, those in the middle and those who have had contact with those who test positive until we can differentiate and then slowly uh, resume what we used to regard as normal, that we will likely face a huge spike in the number of infections and do away with all of the really good and important work that you have all done together as Sacramentans and as Californians. We also cannot do it alone as a city or a county, because as the governor said today, our open society knows no borders and boundaries. If we were to make a decision, uh, which we can't, I don't believe legally, but if we were to say, all right, we're done with this, we're going back, not only would we jeopardize the health and safety of Sacramentans, but we would also be spreading the virus then to other parts of the state as well. And so we'll talk to Dr. Bielensen more about this in a moment in terms of the hopeful signs ahead. But I just wanted to say that protests um, are part of the American way. They're not just to be respected, they're to be honored. But do so um, if you're going to do uh, in-person protests, people should stay in their cars and drive around the Capitol and not get out. So let me move on to one or two other things quickly, and then I will bring Dr. Bielinson in. Um, the Congress is negotiating with the president over stimulus 3.5, which is um, really the, the, the fourth stimulus, but it's only a half measure. Despite the heroic efforts of our representatives in Congress and the congressional leadership in the House, uh, it does not appear that the stimulus is going to include direct aid to cities and counties and to states. And so we have to continue to push and we will continue to push as Californians for direct aids to cities and states. It's not about the city's budget. It's not about the state's budget as a separate entity. It's about the people who depend upon these budgets for health care services, for public safety and for all the other vital things that your state and local governments do. And so 
the federal government is key here. And despite my strong feelings about the performance of the president and, uh, and, and about what has been done and what, what has not been done, we have to continue to ensure that the federal government does everything to step up and aid the states and aid localities. And so this stimulus package, which will provide more small business relief, and that's a good thing, money for testing and some money for uh, the hospitals and healthcare system is not enough. We're going to need another stimulus package that mitigates the real damage that's being done to state and local budgets so that we can provide the services that people uh, rely upon. Let me now uh, bring in Dr. Bielinson, if we can. There he is. Hello. Um, this gentleman in some ways may not need um, much introduction because he has become a, a public figure in his own right, certainly over the past month. Um, and in my opinion, has done a great job. Welcome, Peter. Dr. Bielinson, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Mayor. Yeah, I'm really glad to be having a conversation with you. And I guess I want to start um, by asking you to just talk about um, your background a little bit, how you came to this position in Sacramento County, and what is the chief health officer in Sacramento County? What 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 was your job job description prior to COVID nineteen, and what is your dot job description now? Well, I, I come to Sacramento. It's my second stint, if you want, if you will, in Sacramento. I was here from when I was six until sixteen, because as, as I think you know, my dad was a state senator and a state assemblyman, and so we lived a life quite like your families until he ran for Congress in 1976, and then we moved back east to Washington, and I ended up going to school back east and then <clears throat> uh, becoming the health commissioner in Baltimore for 13 years and then the health commissioner in, in a county in Maryland for another six years, and then the head of a nonprofit cooperative under the Obamacare. So then we moved out here about a year and a half ago, back to my hometown, and I'm very pleased to be back here. And I'm actually not the health officer. The health officer works for me, Olivia Kassiri, um, but I'm the director of health services. And so my job is to be over behavioral health, the Mental Health Services Act, which you obviously um, shepherded through the legislature, um, primary care, the, the federally qualified health center we run in Sacramento County at Stockton and Broadway, and the jail ser health services, as well as all the public health um, efforts as well. So how has your job description changed over the last month? Well, now it's COVID-19 uh, every day, all day, 24-7 not quite 24 seven, but quite a lot. And it's, uh, there's just a lot of different issues that people don't necessarily think of when they're thinking of this viral infection. It's populations that we have to deal with, as we're gonna talk about, I think long-term care folks, people who are homeless and living in congregate shelters, um, those who are middle-aged and younger who may have asymptomatic cases, but we, we have to try and figure out if they're positive or not because that they're the ones who actually can shed the virus and i.e. be contagious and not even know it. So there are a lot of different aspects to this um, infection, to this epidemic that have made things both interesting and, and distressing at the same time. There's Because you and I live this now every day, there are some basic facts that um, we may take for granted that the public may not really completely understand. For example, the city and the county, which are obviously separate entities, the city is, does not have a public health function. We're the, we don't make the decisions about uh, the state home order. It's the county, correct? Correct. We, so we um, partner very well with the, the, the mayor, obviously, yeah. and the city council folks. Um, I talk to them a lot, and I talk to you a lot, obviously, um, and to a lesser extent, the other cities in the, in the county but of the 1.55 million county residents, um, we're the health department for the entire county, including Sacramento's 500,000 residents. So people are familiar with the stay at home order that you issued back uh, in the month of March and then renewed again, I believe just uh, last week. week. Why don't you give just a brief overview of what it says and obviously people know the reason for it, but basically what it, what it says and what it means. So what it says and what it means is basically the same thing. It's a stay at home order. Um, people talk all the time about, are my groceries safe? Is this Amazon box that's delivered safe? 
from the virus, et cetera. And I've said over and over again that by far, far, far and away, the biggest thing that's, that's spreading this virus is the close contact face-to-face -face that people have. And so the, by far the most important thing you can do is socially distance, as you were talking about in terms of the um, protests and have, uh, reduce the social contact as much as you can for a period of time to allow us to bend the curve, which we have done so far. And let's let's just clarify one other jurisdictional issue because it comes up a lot. The relationship between the state of California, you see Governor Newsom every day at noon, they've issued a state stay-at-home order, um, but he's really deferred a lot to the counties and the county health officers for the detail. What's your relationship with the state public health officials? So it's been quite good. I'm Sonia Angel, who's the head of the California Department of Public Health, and, and I talk frequently, as do we, to Mark Daly, who's the head of their HHS, their Health and Human Services, and I talk relatively frequently. And it's to give each other a heads up on what we're going to be proposing. So the governor's order, while it supersedes, if it's stricter, it supersedes county orders, um, in many ways, ours are more detailed. So, for example, we talk about golf courses. I just picked a controversial subject. Um, we'll get back to that one. We can get back to that. Uh, golf courses, um, real estate, uh, a large number of, um, or, of business entities that we've considered essential that may not have been listed specifically in the governor's order. Good. I just think that's, again, we're, we're on the inside here and deal with this every day, but a lot of people may not realize, again, that the city does not make the health orders, although we, we are working hand in glove, not just you and I, but the entire county organization and the city organization, since the city is the largest city within, within Sacramento County, um, and that the state has issued an order uh, the county order is consistent with, and but in some ways, more more detailed. So yes. let's get to the question that is maybe the most important question uh, on everybody's mind. What is it going to take for both the state and the county to potentially amend and or ultimately lift the state at home order? So I'll, I have printed out here in front of me, which I won't, I'll try not to read, um, but the six criteria the state and the governor have put out for when we can start loosening up. And they are expanding testing, which I know we're going to talk about, protecting high-risk groups, including the seniors and homeless and medically vulnerable people, which relates very much to the, ability, the availability of testing, ensuring that hospitals have enough beds and other facilities to be able to take care of a potential spike of patients, which we're doing very well, by the way particularly here in Sacramento, where we have a large amount of capacity still in the hospitals. We only have 45 or 50 patients in the hospital due to COVID, which is remarkable considering that we're 1.5 million people. And we have hundreds and hundreds of ventilators. So we're doing well in that regard. The fourth criteria is to progress in developing treatments. And we could talk a little bit about remdesivir, or whatever it's called, redemdesivir. From UC um, Davis. Right. Yeah. Um, the ability of schools and businesses to support physical distancing and the ability to decide when we reinstitute uh, stay at home if things get a little bit out of control. So those are the criteria. And again, they're predominantly testing and, um, and uh, the ability of hospitals to maintain their capacity. And that, that's what's really important. So you and I talk every day about testing because um, while the state certainly is leading and grappling with how they increase the, the supply, not just of test kits, but of the materials that are actually necessary to make the test kits work. Um, they've been clear with us that we also ought to do everything in our power to try to increase our testing capacity. So why don't we give the, the people watching here just a little bit of an update about what it is we have been talking about. My colleague Steve Hansen's been involved in the conversation. We've been talking to um, some private sector companies. We've been talking to our universities. What are we trying, how, how much are we testing today across the county and where are we trying to get to over what period of time and how might we get there? Right. So we currently are testing about 50 to 100 people at our public health lab. Those are primarily healthcare workers who've been exposed to the virus and those seniors and, and um, people with underlying health conditions who have 
serious symptoms. That's all we're able to test at our health department lab. And that's what's come from the federal government, which is basically nothing. We then have a Verily, a group called Verily, which is related to Google, which is doing a drive-through clinic in Sacramento County, and uh, Sacramento, sorry, at Cal Expo, where we do between 200 and 350 people per day. And then there are individual hospital and individual doctors who see their own patients who can prescribe a, 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 a test and will test them and they're sent off to national laboratory companies where there's a five to seven day wait period, which is not particularly useful. So we're, tra- we're testing in Sacramento in any given day, several hundred to maybe a thousand people. But our estimate is that we need about 25 to 50,000 tests to be able to serve those who are long-term care facilities and assisted living um, because they're the most seriously at risk. And interestingly enough, in tests that we've done of senior citizens at these senior centers, a lot of them are relatively asymptomatic, which is a very good thing. But by testing them, we get to, and we we find out if they're positive, we know to stay on, or the the caretakers know to stay on top of those folks if anything um, goes amiss so that they can prevent them from being hospitalized or, or worse. And the other group that we need to serve with testing, which we're not able to test right now, are the um, congregate sheltered homeless folks at a lot of our shelters who obviously are both vulnerable because they can't wash their hands, the kinds of things we're always telling people to do, and because they often have underlying health conditions and because they're older oftentimes. So we're we're trying to get enough tests to be able to do that. Um, I can just say that the it's outrageous the lack of help we've gotten from the federal government. In fact, the federal government often steps in and takes stuff away from local jurisdictions. And we've been working very closely with California, but California depends on the feds for their testing stuff. And so what we've had to do now is go on the open market. Um, where We are working with UC Davis and UC San Francisco, looking at their abilities to test, as well as some private firms. And I agree with you, by the way, about the federal government. And I know everyone's been very careful to not politicize this. And understandably so, because we need to be in partnership. But when you just do a little historic reference about the difference between the federal government's role in past crises, whether they be wars or other public health epidemics, the federal government led and provided the states with all the necessary supplies and and in the case of war, uh, didn't provide the weaponry to the states, but actually led the country and the world in making sure that we dealt with whatever the uh, w- whatever the great threat was to world health or world peace. And that just plain isn't happening today. And it's evident. And so we are all grappling with it. We're not complaining, as the governor said. If we can get to 25 or 50,000 tests, we'll at least be able to reduce the spread of the virus because we will have the ability to test some of the more vulnerable populations. Is that correct? That's correct. And just to make your point, sorry if I could jump in no. for a second. I was health commissioner in Baltimore during 9-11 when there was obviously a Republican president. And then it's national, the strategic national stockpile, which is exactly what it sounds like it's supposed to be, was utilized and was adequate in terms of helping those institutions around the Washington DC area, particularly to respond, not just to the 9-11 disaster, but also to potential bioterrorism things. For example, we dealt with a, um, a um, uh, oh my God, what's it called? Uh, outbreak, uh, anthrax, sorry. Anthrax, anthrax outbreak. Right. Um, with, and we had gowns and we had PPE, et cetera, at a time when you would have thought that actually that they may not have had much of a national stockpile because it was just after nine, it was with 9-11, which hadn't happened obviously until that time. So it's really an outrageous thing that we have such a woefully inadequate strategic national stockpile. So I just want to dive a little deeper on the testing issue because I think it's important that people understand this. So we are aiming and it's a big task to, and we've been working on this now for a couple of weeks to work with our University of California, Davis, maybe another UC, maybe a private company to get an additional capacity of 25 to 50,000 tests. That will enable us to test some of our more vulnerable populations as a way again to mitigate the risk of additional spread, but it will not be enough testing, correct? To be able to enable us to 
know who in the general population um, has the virus and who doesn't and, and to be able to return to, to, to work and to other prior, prior community activities. Right. So there's a couple of things there. First of all, to make to um, for people's education or people's um, information, there are two types of tests, as I, I know you're well aware. One is the viral test, which the tests the virus. actual presence of the virus and gives you either a positive or a negative result. In most cases, correct. Um, and that's important both to test people. And if we test, for example, a homeless gentleman who tests positive, he gets isolated in a motel room or one of the trailers at Cal Expo. But then we have to know when he, when he's better. So not only do you have to do one test to if they're positive, you have to do follow up tests to see if someone goes back negative and is able to be allowed back into uh, around the you know around the community. The second type of test is antibody test, which we're not we have not yet developed a good test for, um, and because they're not being sensitive enough tests, so we need an antibody test, which will clearly be a blood test, not a finger prick, as has originally been talked about but a blood draw, which will tell us if you have antibodies, which you develop if you get infected by the virus and recuperate, at least 80% of people do. There's unfortunately about 20 to 30% of people who have been infected by the virus have recovered and apparently do not generate antibodies, which means probably they do not have immunity. So this antibody test will be important in terms of releasing you to travel about the cabin, if you will, the, the, the nation. Um, but it will only be good enough for 70 to 80% of people. And so when we talk about increasing our testing capacity between 25 and 50,000 tests, we're talking about the former test. We're talking Which about tests only, yes. And statewide and nationally, there is not yet a scaled, reputable uh, antibody tests that, that we can use. Not, not, they're being developed all over the place. They're apparently, UC Davis is actually close to developing a very good um, test for the antibody, but it's not widespread use yet. So with, with more diagnostic tests, but without the antibody test at some sort of scale, what does that mean in terms of the ability for people to return to, to work and to community? We're flying, to be honest, we're flying partly blind. Um, so we're basing it on how much infection there has been, how many hospitalization, how much hospitalization there's been, et cetera, which we've done very well on. But that's just a sort of a, um, a marker, if you will, for approximately how we're doing with the virus and the spread of the virus. Um, but it's really going to be important to have the antibody test down the road in the relatively near future to be able to be at least pretty sure about many people having antibodies and having immunity. And will there be some ways to gradually resume some businesses, for example, even before we have the antibody test? Yeah. So on May 1st, our order is up. Um, we'll we'll re reimpose it, obviously, but in a, with a, probably a lighter restriction. So for example, restaurants are a perfect example. I'm not saying this is going to be in our order, but it could be things like this. So restaurants, which obviously are not allowed to do anything but take out and drive through right now, um, may be allowed to open at a certain percent of capacity, let's say a third or a half capacity in terms of their tables in the restaurant. And so you'd have to actually change the layout in the restaurant. The work servers and the preparers of food would have to wear masks, probably gloves, and you get menus that would be disposable, that would be thrown, thrown away after one use, you know, a paper um, menu. And that'll allow, and then obviously socially, social distancing between people, patrons in the restaurant. That's the kind of thing that we'll be looking at doing uh, in the near future. And, and you'll do it in coordination and um, cooperation with the state public health officials. Absolutely with the state. And I should point out that the last thing that will allow to loosen up, which, which goes again to the protests you were mentioning at the beginning, is large gatherings in small areas, which is exactly what was happening with the protests. So that's like the last thing that will loosen up. For example, sporting events and other types of things with real with full um, full fans is going to be a while before it opens up. But even opening up some businesses like restaurants in a modified way that you just described 
carry will carry some risk and it will still have to be carefully considered before either the state or the county would modify its order. Right. And I actually get every day um, a printout of all the hospital beds whether that are COVID positive, that are the capacity that they have to see additional patients, number of ventilators, number of ICU rooms, et cetera. And so we keep tightly and tightly in contact with that information to make sure that we're not seeing a spike. Okay, and so I think it's really important that people follow um, this closely uh, in terms of understanding the thought process that while we are guided by the science, that even with the science in the absence of the, uh, of the antibody test, that it is a cost benefit and it's a weighing of risks and that human life comes first and yet, as the governor said, and as I've said, as we all have, all have said, that what we're doing now is not sustainable for the long term, right. um, it, from a health perspective or from eco an ec economic perspective. But there isn't just some easy to plug in model that tells you that on May X, um, we can do the following. It's a judgment call in the end, correct? Right. Right, it is, and it, actually, I was under a lot more stress until the governor gave his order because we were planning our orders, and I, we, we, not just myself, but our health officer and others in public health, really took a lot of uh, to put a lot of pressure on us to make the right decision or what we hope would be the right decision because people's lives depend on it. So actually, it was very nice when the governor added on his his order, which kind of gave a statewide framework for things. But the, the thing, as I've said to you many times, there's no hundred percent. We, we, there's no 2020. Um, you only there's only 2020 hindsight. There's not 2020 foresight, if you will. And so it's it's a judgment call on a lot of things, educated but judgment. So just to put a a, a, a conclusion on this part of the co uh, continuing conversation, let's just say tomorrow that the state and the county were to just decide what you won't, and rightfully so, that you were gonna lift the stay at home order, what would that mean for COVID-19 and the risk of serious illness or death for how many people in Sacramento? So the stay at home order would, it would well, people like myself was as a chronic underlying condition in 60, um, I'd be exposed to people who were exposed to people and I could get it infected and become ill. Um, my mom, who's at an assisted living center, if they opened the stay at the home um, order completely, people could come and go as they as they please, which would bring in the virus to both staff and the patients. That's if you know if they listed the stay at home order. Um, similarly, uh, homeless folks would not be protected if they tested positive. We wouldn't know if they tested positive because they, we don't have enough tests. And we wouldn't have any place to put them because the stay at home order would be out of out the door. And the guidance from the CDC on encampments, for example, would be thrown away. So there, there's a lot of there are a lot of ramifications if they actually lifted the stay at home order completely. It, it would probably mean uh, at least the risk of a huge spike in infections yes. across, across the general population, in addition to the. the oh, yes. Yes. population. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Hey, let's talk about masks for a moment, because this is one that comes up um, a lot from our constituents um, who, one another, the county has not issued a mandatory order for people to wear masks. Why is that? Well, in part, it's because we don't have enough surgical masks. So there's three types of masks. There's N95, which people know is now very well because of the, the, the fires of a couple of years ago and the smoke that followed as well as the um, uh, COVID stuff. So those N95s get out 95% of the particulate matter and they are solely reserved for healthcare workers and the like. It should not be used by other people. Then there are surgical masks, which are more like paper masks, but they have a aluminum crinkly aluminum thing that you can put on your nose. Excuse me, and those help probably help to prevent people from spreading the virus from themselves to others. And then there's the other mask, which I would call ad hoc face covers, um, which I've made several of, which include a bandana and a coffee filter with two rubber bands around it. And it actually works quite well. Um, 
and it too helps to prevent the spread. So if people on both sides, those who are um, who might be ill and those who are trying to prevent themselves from being ill, both wear masks or face covers, the evidence is somewhat significant that that will make a difference. But the main reason we're not we're requiring everybody to wear a mask is because we don't have enough um, masks. But just to be clear, it's your strong recommendation that yes. people um, make their own mask or do whatever mm-hmm. they have to do and wear a mask when you're out doors among the public. Yeah, you should wear a face covering whenever you're outdoors and around the public. If you're okay. out walking your dog and you're not, you know, close to someone, you don't necessarily have to, but otherwise you should. You know what's cool? I'm going to show this here. There are people all over the community who are taking to making their own mask. And there's a, a woman in Sacramento, Natasha Scott, who um, is making these beautiful yeah. cloth masks here. I've got a couple of them here. And she uh, is putting out a little bit of a challenge. She will have this on our website, uh, you know, on our, our social media tomorrow. She's willing to make at least 100 of these things. Uh, people will pay for them, and then she'll donate all the money to the food bank. So there's a lot of that kind of thing going around. I mean, you can, you can go online and get a mask, but even if you, you can't or not willing to do that, you can make your own mask with a bandana really easily, and it's not a substitute for physical distancing, but it's a right. good addition, right? right? That's exactly right. Okay. See, look, at, I, I'm not an MD, but, you know, I'm, I'm picking it up by osmosis. What can I say? You know, president. <laughs> so I want to talk about the homeless problem, in it, which is another subject that you and I talk about all of the time. The city and the county uh, together have stood up a really aggressive and hopeful plan. 990 beds, uh, 805 hotel rooms, 63 trailers, expanding beds in a way that create more isolation in our existing shelters. Um, And and so talk a little bit about that um, and what you think that means for Sacramento. Then I'm gonna, I wanna ask a couple questions and dialogue a little with you. Sure. So as we were mentioning earlier, when we're t- when we begin testing people full time um, in the in the in the uh, shelters, there'll be those who have tested positive and they are they go to the trailers initially and eventually to hotel rooms. So they get isolated. Anyone who has symptoms also gets isolated. And then if, as long as we have room, which we do now, we bring in other people who are at risk but may not be positive. For example, people 55 and older, sorry, 55 and older, yes, who have underlying conditions. And we're looking at potentially going down to a younger population as well who would be at risk for the virus, particularly because of underlying conditions, um, but wouldn't otherwise be because of their age. So, yeah, that's a good overview and it's been well reported. So. Um We've got a team of city and county folks, a lot of our providers, uh, Sacramento Steps Forward, that are all really working hard to stand this up. And what I push for every day is even greater urgency and making sure that no matter what we do, we do not leave any of those beds left over by the time uh, this crisis moves on to another phase because right now we get 75% reimbursement from FEMA from the federal government for everybody we put in a motel room. And some cities are, um, are ahead of us, or excuse me, some counties are ahead of us uh, in terms of actually placing people in the motels. This week, I expect to see um, a real uh, a, a real step up in terms of the numbers of people. But one thing that I feel very strongly about that I want to ask you for, I understand that um, the people who are COVID positive or who have symptoms are first. But what we're finding is that those numbers, fortunately, are actually not overwhelmingly large. And then that leaves the people who, as you say, are over 55, 55 or over, or who have fragile health conditions who would otherwise be eligible. In my opinion, anybody who has been out on the street for a long time, by definition, has a fragile health condition. And that's the majority of people who are chronically homeless. I would like to see us really relax 
if not eliminate the age requirement and simply say um, in a very generous way, generous in terms of our, our, our spirit here, that if you've been on the street for, uh, for more than X amount of time, that you meet the fragile health condition definition and we're bringing you into a motel. Um, what do you think of my radical idea? I think it's not that radical. <clears throat> Several of us have been thinking along the same lines. And I think we're just going to see a little bit longer how many patients, how many people who are positive or who have symptoms come in. And if there's capacity, I think we'll probably allow that to happen. The other thing I should point out that we've done, I think, fairly well on is the encampment strategy, where we follow the, um, the CDC guidance um, very well, where we don't, we don't allow them to be encampment members to be shredded encampments to be shredded or moved apart. People are encouraged to be 12 feet apart. We've gotten 40 um, porta potties with water fountains, with hand washing stations in them, as well as hand sanitizer out to people. The PG, the Procter and Gamble um, gallons and gallons that they have, but they hadn't um, figured out a way to put them into individual bottles. We're, talk we're talking about putting a spigot on it. We're talking to PG to put a spigot on it to allow us to um, Put out more hand sanitizer for others. So we're, I think we're doing a good job at helping to get hygiene on this on the um, encampments for people who uh, either do or do, uh, especially for those who decide to stay out there um, for whatever reason. Um, but the shelters, we clearly need to do uh, the testing. That's really important. Yeah. The other concern I've heard from some is, well, what's the point of bringing people into trailers or motels for say two or three months uh, when the crisis is most uh, severe and then when it ends and the FEMA reimbursement goes away, uh, they're just gonna be returned to the streets. Um, and you know, what I say is that first of all, um, this is an incredible opportunity to first get people into temporary housing. And once they're in the temporary housing, there is going to be appropriate, um, enormous pressure to make sure that we don't then just turn people back out to the streets. So what we're doing in the city, and I know the county is thinking the same thing, working with our housing authority, is we are planning in real time what it would take to actually move a thousand or more people from the motels and the trailers into more permanent housing. We're looking at everything from manufactured housing to uh, tiny homes and efficiency homes to actually purchasing uh, some of these motels so that the motels could be permanent places for people to live. And I guess my bottom line, the two bottom lines for me, um, and, and I know we, we, go, we, we talk about this a lot, is I just think um, fragile health condition ought to be the criteria regardless of age. But the real bottom line is uh, we have got to commit ourselves with great urgency to not leave a single one of those 990 beds unfilled or unused um, uh, given um, the enormity of the pre-existing crisis on our street, given the COVID-19 risk of spread, and given our great opportunity to be able to make a real dent in the homeless problem. Yeah, and I think that also the... Um the recently released 12 or 1400 people from the main jail um, are people who potentially can be taken care of with good mental health services out in the community instead. So I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities that this um, unfortunately deadly virus has, has spread around, um, but there's, you have to grasp at them. No, I know. I'm glad you raised the jail issue, which hasn't been talked about a lot because We've also been in regular conversation with the uh, administrative officer of the Sacramento courts, um, Judge Connolly, who is former assembly member, city council member, and a great Sacramentan. Um, the, the courts have essentially been ordered statewide to reduce the size of the jails um, because of the risk of COVID spreading, which is absolutely appropriate. The issue then is what happens with people who are released who don't have a place to live. And so we're going to be on another one of those famous Zoom calls this week talking about how we can match services uh, to those who are most at risk, who are released from the jail, who don't have a place to go. So it's a very complicated problem. But 
All I know is we never had 990 beds at one time before to be able to do something positive. And I know we're, we're, we're going to get there together, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So what about a long-term care facilities? I know that's another major concern of yours. What, um, talk about that for a moment. So we, we talked, we touched on that. There's assisted living. There are 1,347. Thanks to Michelle Callejas, who's, uh, one of my colleagues figured this out. 13,400 or so folks who are in either nursing homes or assisted living places. And very, very few of them have been tested, um, despite the fact that there have been a significant number of outbreaks. So we have decided that we're going to test, as soon as we get enough testing available, as we talked about at the very beginning, that we're going to try and test every single staff and resident at every site that has one positive COVID patient, um, which would be, I think, unique in the country, or at least unique in the state. you know, and again, the reason for that is to get a better feel for how many of our seniors who are most vulnerable would have the disease, how we can segregate people who don't have it and do have it, how you try and have staff who's positive not taking care of patients who are negative, which right now we don't know in most places, and also to get us, us uh, to prepare people who test positive, particularly residents who test positive, to take care of them more um, vigilantly, if you will than we might otherwise do because we know that they're positive. And a lot of these seniors can be taken care of at their ho- at their um, in their own rooms. Um, for example, the, at, well, at one of the places that has a sizable number of cases, only two people have been hospitalized and all the others are doing well. So that, that gives some kind of confidence that actually the seniors may not be as horribly, as severely affected as it was originally the case, thought to be the case. Right. That's that is a that is a a, a ray of hope here. Um, and, and just back to the testing for a moment, because it relates uh, so much to this issue of the senior care facilities. Uh, what what is the time frame? Do you think for procuring these additional twenty five thousand to fifty thousand tests? Well, we're actively negotiating with them now at these various entities. I would hope by the by next week we would have a decision on one or the other, and hopefully then it depends completely on the materiel that those folks have. For example, do they have enough swabs? Do they have enough reagent that would be um, used to to um, to look at the virus? Um, it's really going to be uh, supply. It's not so much the ability to do it, but we'll have a company or a university to do it in the next week or so. It'll be whether they have, they can get the supplies. Yeah. So it's a week's time frame, which means I don't have to uh, call you tomorrow and say what's happening with testing. <laughs> yeah, that'd be OK. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you about one maybe less important issue, but it's it's relevant. Uh, and that is um, the, the issue of how you differentiate in the public order, county public order, what what's allowed in terms of outdoor activity and what isn't. So I think you're referring to the golf courses. Yeah, yes. Uh, as, a tennis, and, as a tennis player, I need to know. Yes, as a tennis player. And being a tennis player but not a golfer, it actually you'd think I might have come the other way. Um, the reason that we did that is because um, we're trying to encourage as much outdoor activity as possible where people don't touch the same um, ball or, or racket, which obviously you do in tennis. Um, in golf, you don't have to do it because the cup that is um, at the hole – can be flipped upside down, so you don't have to reach in and grab to take out the ball. Um, and and you can have social distancing rules, and you can have rules on cleaning the carts, etc. All of which re- requires people to somewhat do it on their own honor. However, I went out um, undercover in my sweats and my actually in this exact outfit um, a couple weeks ago on a fr- very nice Friday. There are true. There's lots of cars in the parking garage. But the driving range was appropriately spaced. The putting range was appropriately spaced. There were markers on the ground as to where you could wait to get into the pro club, pro um, shop to get your tea time. Everybody was out on their golf carts individually. Um, and I went to three different golf courses to see that. So that made me feel better. But then we've had a few complaints. So I called all the executive directors of every golf course in Sacramento County, of which I think there are 18 or 20. And reiterated to them that if they were going to be a bad actor, we'd have to close the places down. So we, I've been fairly um, 
fairly impressed by how well they've tended to um, to make things right. But again, let's, let's, let's bring this to a close. You know, last question. How are you dealing with all of this? Um, give us give us some perspective here about what you've seen in your career, what this experience has been like, and how you're taking care of yourself. So um, in the 30 years that I've been a public health official, this is about the sixth novel virus, a new virus that's come along from SARS, MERS, West Nile, H5N1, and H1N1. Um, they've all been novel viruses, um, many of which did not have a great treatment, nor an immunization, at least not to start with. So it's not a brand new situation. It is, it's, the, the biggest issue is how much attention it gets, frankly. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to diminish it. It's a communicable disease that's quite communicable and it can be deadly across the age span. That's very clear now. It's not just seniors um, because people can have particularly, particularly um, broad inflammation reactions um, to the virus um, unknow, un, without relatively arbitrarily. Um, so it can affect a lot of people, but I think part of the um, hysteria, if you can call it that, has been the incredible amount of media attention. It's an incredible amount. I mean, if you watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox, they have the the same thing as a, as a election night countdown of you know delegate total uh, in terms of how many people are dead and how many people are tested positive and what state and et cetera, et cetera. And there every every media outlet out there is having to churn out new information every 10 minutes. So I think that's been part of it, actually. I'm not diminishing the seriousness of this illness, um, but and, and it's sort of dangerous to go back to the flu again. But in a, in a really bad flu year, there are 50, 60, 80,000 people killed. Killed, not infected. There are 50 million people infected in the United States alone. And so we're at 30-something thousand now, which, again, is horribly tragic, no question about it. Um, but I'm, I'm impressed by how much the attention it's gotten um, compared to everything else in the world. But you're, you're, you're beginning even in your own mind, though, to weigh the, to weigh the equities here. Yeah. And, and the thing that's important to point out is, you know, you and I are in our house. I shouldn't tell people you're in your house. Um, I am. Yeah, you're in your house. You know, we're in our house. We have our jobs. We're going to have our jobs when we go back to them. Um, the most we have to worry about is not going to a restaurant or not getting to see our friends, except on Zoom. But there are immense numbers of working people who have to work, um, including the grape pickers and the fruit, you know, the fruit harvesters in the Central Valley, all of which is essential activity for a wide, wide variety of reasons. That if they get sick. They, they don't have the, the sick leave and they can get fired, laid off, as can workers in the um, in all sorts of food um, and other activities that are essential. And then especially in the non-essential activities, non-essential businesses are closing in huge numbers and they're laying people off left and right. So there's, it's, it's, that, that strikes me as an important, important balancing act, if you will, between the economy, the economics and the health. And obviously, we want to fall on the side of health in most in the you know in the large picture. But I I don't not think about the um, workers. Well, I I completely uh, share that sentiment about the economic damage. But just to to close it out, the dilemma that you faced, and the dilemma that we face as a society, is that some of those models, which uh, I know are not always 100% accurate, have said that without the distancing, that the rates of infection would have been dramatically higher right. and that many more people would have died. So right. that, that's the balance, right? Right. And again, there's no 2024 site um, and we won't know what would have happened because, there, as you said, there are, there are just models. Um, but I think, you know, you, you I'm very science oriented and data driven and in general, that's what we've been following as the models to make sure we're on the safe, on the, um, the preservation of life side as much as possible. All right, let's leave it at that. And um, maybe we'll resume this conversation, um, you know, very, very soon because 
this is all changing, of course, in real time as well. And hopefully we are going to have continued progress on the testing issue in Sacramento County, continued progress in terms of upping our numbers of homeless people that we get uh, in these motel rooms and trailers, um, some potential of, of modification of the stay at home orders, depending upon what's happening statewide. Um, this will get better um, in, yes, all, well. in all regards if we just if we just stick together. And I really yeah. appreciate your work and uh, appreciate all your time tonight, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. Good night, everyone. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.